praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy health and salvation. him in glad adoration praise to the lord who doth prosper thy work and defend thee surely his goodness and mercy here daily Good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Presbyterian Church of Santa Monica. We're glad that you're here, and if you are with us at 10 a.m., congratulations, you remembered that today was Daylight Savings Time. If, however, you're joining us at 11 a.m., thinking that it's 10 a.m., you can obviously continue to to be a part of the service, or you can pause and join us on our uh, Zoom coffee hour Uh, at 11 a.m. The link to the Zoom, uh, the Zoom link is in the description below. Uh, But either way, we're glad that you're here, and we're continuing our journey through Lent, and we're looking at the Psalms as we travel um, during this time. In the next few weeks, we'll eventually uh, get to Palm Sunday on March 28th, and then April 4th is Easter. Uh, We're obviously not there yet, but we hope that you'll continue with us along uh, along this journey. So, um, as we continue in worship, please join me in prayer. Uh, Jesus, we thank you that you continue to be close to us in the midst of these crazy times. And we pray that your spirit would continue to join us together as a church community and as a world, even though we're, we're still apart. We pray that you'd continue to inspire us. We pray that you'd continue to challenge us, give us strength, and also help us to grow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
morning and welcome to Children's Time. During the season of Lent, we are spending Holy Week with Jesus in Jerusalem. We shouted Hosanna as Jesus entered the city riding on a donkey. We followed Jesus into the temple and watched him overturn the tables of the money changers. We listened in as Jesus spotted a widow offering two tiny coins worth less than a penny to the temple treasury and then he told his disciples that she had given more than anyone else. While Jesus spent his days in Jerusalem teaching in the temple and criticizing the religious leaders, in the evenings he would leave the city and stay with friends. In today's story, Jesus and his disciples have gone to the house of Simon in Bethany, just outside of Jerusalem. While they are eating there, something happens that surprises everyone. Let's watch and see what happened. At this time, the Jewish people were getting ready to celebrate a festival called Passover that had been celebrated since the time of Moses when God brought his people out of Egypt. Two days before the Passover, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon. Hey, 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 come on in a man who had previously had leprosy. While Jesus was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful jar of expensive perfume. She broke the jar open and poured perfume over Jesus' head. Jesus' disciples were upset when they saw this. They said, what a waste. It could have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. What'd you do that for? So they scolded the woman. Ah, uh, hold on there. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why criticize her for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you, and you can help them whenever you want to, but you will not always have me. She has poured this perfume on me to prepare my body for burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered. Have you ever given someone an amazing gift? Uh, not just an ordinary gift, but something you worked extra hard to make or to get for them? Well, then you understand what the woman was doing when she poured the expensive perfume on Jesus' head. While the disciples complained that it was a waste of money because the perfume was so expensive, Jesus praised the woman for her act of extravagant love saying that she has done a good thing for me. Like the widow in the temple who gave all that she had to God, this woman also gave all that she had to show her love for Jesus. And unlike the words and actions of the Jewish religious leaders in the temple, or even Jesus' own disciples sometimes, the actions of the widow in the temple and this woman show us what it means to follow Jesus and to live God's way. It means giving to God and to our family and friends gifts of extravagant love. So let's say together, God loves me, God is for me, God is always with me. Thank you, God, for these stories of extravagant love. Amen. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. At the end of the movie Jaws, the two heroes of the movie are swimming safely back to land, floating on pieces of the boat that Jaws destroyed with his giant shark mouth. But they won. They defeated the monster shark, and now the water is calm. And Captain Brody says, I used to hate the water. To which his friend replies, I can't imagine why. Wait, I used to hate the water? Like past tense. I was afraid of the water until I was almost killed by a giant man-eating shark and, and now the water's not so bad. 
seems a, a bit backwards. Obviously, Jaws is a fictional movie, and, and as a movie, like so many sea monster stories, the beast is a symbol for the, the worst the ocean can throw at us. So if we conquer the beast, then the ocean is subdued, which is why at the end of Jaws, the water is calm. And they are calm enough, at least, to joke about the traumatic event that they just went through. In movies like this, you don't defeat Jaws, and then on the way back to land, you get stung by a bunch of jellyfish or, or something else. No, the sea has already done its worst, at least until the sequel. We've seen some of this here in the Psalms. The Psalms look back to the creation story to celebrate God conquering the waters of chaos so that we and life and nature might flourish and experience God's goodness. The metaphor of water that is turbulent and pushing back against its boundaries is a way for the poet to talk about life's struggles. But so far, through the good and the bad, God is the one who can care for us and calm the waters. God is our anchor and safe harbor. Last week in Psalm 54, um, even, we heard, even if everything changes and falls apart, there is one constant, God's presence, specifically God's presence in the Jerusalem temple that will always be there, that will never go away. Our faith is grounded there in the temple with God. But what happens when we lose that anchor and safe place? What happens when our faith is thrown into chaos? What happens when the sea and its monsters win? Well, let's see what Psalm 74 can tell us about this. So Psalm 74, uh, beginning with verse 1, Why, O God, have you abandoned us forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pastor? Remember your congregation, which you acquired long ago, which you redeemed to be the tribe of your heritage. Remember Mount Zion, where you came to dwell in the temple. Direct your steps to the everlasting ruins. The enemy has destroyed everything in the sanctuary. As Inigo Montoya said to Andre the Giant in The Princess Bride, that is the sound of ultimate suffering. This is not just a physical pain. This is not just emotional pain or relational pain. But all of those things together with a spiritual pain and, and perhaps a loss of faith. Why, O oh God, have you abandoned us forever? Direct your steps to the everlasting or eternal ruins. Forever and eternal? Well, that's a long time. What other words can you use to express such loss? And we hear this in our home too, although clearly not in these bad of circumstances, but we hear, oh, school is taking forever, or it's my turn, Noah has been playing the Xbox forever, or I'm so hungry, dinner is taking forever. I don't personally often use the word forever, but in the middle of a conflict, I have been known to throw in words like always and never. Like, why do you always fill in the blank, insert bad behavior? Or you never blank, insert um, good behavior. Now, our struggles are pretty mild compared to this psalm, so, so why do we use this exaggerated and eternal language? I don't know about you, but for us, I think we're trying to get someone to pay attention. I think we're trying to get someone to take us, our, our emotions and our experiences, seriously. Do you ever do this? Oh, this sermon is taking forever. See, it, it can work. God, where are you? Pay attention to us. Can you see us? Can you see me? 
Can you see what's happening in my life? So using the message translation, this is how the poet describes what they're going through. So continuing in verse four, while your people were at worship, your enemies barged in brawling and scrawling graffiti. They set fire to the porch, axes swinging, they chopped up the woodwork, beat down the doors with sledgehammers, then split them into kindling. They burned your holy place to the ground, violated the place of worship. They said to themselves, we'll wipe them all out and burn down all the places of worship. There is not a sign or symbol of God in sight, nor anyone to speak in his name. No one who knows what's going on. So about 600 years before Jesus, the Babylonian Empire invaded Jerusalem and destroyed everything, including the temple. And then they took thousands of Jews captive and deported them back to Babylon. Like the Holocaust, this moment in history left a traumatic scar that to this day impacts the Jewish community. But the author of this psalm is calling out to God from within the rubble of their city, from the place that used to be their home. They are calling out from the rubble of the temple, the place that used to be God's home. All of this is so fresh in this psalm. This is so disorienting because in the midst of all kinds of trouble, the one thing that anchored them was God's presence in the temple. Even if everything changed, the temple was the one thing that would always be there. It would always be there. This is a crisis of faith at the deepest level. The Babylonians have invaded, they've destroyed everything. And in the midst of the rubble, they set up signs and images of their gods, signs and images telling the people, our gods are stronger than your God. Our gods have won and your God is dead. Well, it just so happens that among the gods of Babylon is, is one named Tiamat, goddess of, of the sea, goddess of, you might guess, chaos. So as we've been talking about all this water in the Psalms, the Babylonian invasion brings all of this together. This military invasion is like a flood bringing only chaos and pain. Order and goodness have been destroyed and washed away completely. This army is like Tiamat's personal army of monsters that she created to wage war on the other gods in their sacred text. She gave birth to the dragon, the serpents, and Hydra, but then it seems that they, they sort of start running low on creative ideas because then comes Fishman and, and Dogman, and my personal favorite, the hairy hero, which which might be the beginning of the legend of Bigfoot? I, I don't know. But Hydra, for all you Marvel comic fans, is the sea monster who inspired the underground Nazi terrorist organization named Hydra that Captain America and the Avengers try to keep from gaining total world domination. Hydra and the other monsters were told in the Babylonian stories had sharp teeth, obviously. Their bodies were filled with poison rather than blood. Tiamat clothed the fearful monsters with dread and made them godlike. These are the stories being told by the occupying enemy. These are the stories being told by the uh, to the Jewish captives in Babylon. These are the stories told by the winners to the defeated people. Who, who are they to argue? Who are they to claim that their God is the one true God? From this moment on, this is a community struggling and wrestling with their faith. 
This moment will change them forever. And if, if their faith is to survive, it will need to evolve. What, what will they hold on to? And what will, what will they have to leave behind? Has your faith ever gone through a crisis like this? Have you ever wondered, where is God? Has your faith, for whatever reason, ever had to change or evolve or, or be reformed, as, as we Presbyterians like to say? This psalm won't resolve the crisis, but it gives us a glimpse into the beginnings of the struggle, the honesty, the confusion, the doubting, the questioning, the accusing, and the begging. But just when it feels like all is lost, the poet reaches back to consider what might be worth keeping. For all we hear, for, for we hear in, in verse 12, yet God, my king, is from of old. The relationship, the history, the meaningful moments are still a part of them. So they remain committed and call on God to also remain committed. So in verse 12, yet God, my King, is from of old, working salvation in the earth. You, God, divided the sea by your might. You broke the heads of the dragons in the waters. You crushed the heads of Leviathan, a, a watery mythical serpent. You gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. This psalm tells us that this struggling community isn't ready to give in to despair. They're not willing to accept that our world is all meaningless chaos. Once upon a time, God defeated the chaos monsters. But, but real life isn't like the movies. The waters haven't remained calm. But maybe, just maybe, God will still act. Maybe, just maybe, God will show up and once again create space for something new and something good. If you've ever gone through a faith crisis, you know that it's not easy. If you've ever, if your faith has ever had to evolve, you know that it can be really disorienting. But the hope is that a faith that is growing and evolving is a faith that is alive. The hope is that it's a faith that in spite of the growing pains will eventually produce something that is even more welcoming, more just, more meaningful, and more true. Well, we're not there yet. So next week, let's see how the psalm can help, help carry us or walk with us through, through these crazy times. Redemption's hill where your blood was spilled for my ransom. Everything I was held dear, I count it all as lost. Lead me to the cross where your
Please join me as we pray together. Jesus, thank you for your faithful presence with us. Whether or not we have always felt like you are with us. And during this pandemic, during this year, we take just a moment to to reflect upon where our faith has been or where our faith is in this moment. Have we felt like God was close? Have we wondered where God is? Have we wanted God to act or to be faithful in a specific way? Thank you, Jesus, for giving us space to allowing the breadth of our human experience, both our faith and our our doubts and unbelief. Thank you that your presence with us through it all allows us in our faith to evolve and to change and to be reformed. And thank you for a community of faithful people who support us in moments when we find it hard to believe. We take just a moment to examine where we are and what we want to say to God, just like we find in the Psalms. Jesus, we trust that you do care for us. And we know that you care for for all people, for everyone. And so we take a moment to pray for what's happening in our own lives, to pray for the people that are around us that we love and that we interact with on a daily basis, to pray for what's happening in this world. And finally, Jesus, we're thankful that we can lean against you as we pray the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I have lost my appetite And the flood is welling up behind my eyes So I eat the tears I cry And if that were not enough They know just the words to cut and tear and prod 
When they ask me where's your God Why are you downcast, oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? I can remember when you showed your face to me As a deer pants for water, so my soul thirsts for you And when I behold your glory, you so faithfully renew Like a bed of rest for my fainting flesh I am satisfied in you When I'm staring at the ground It's an inbred feedback loop That brings me down So it's time to lift my brow And remember better days When I loved to worship you And all your ways With the sweetest songs of praise Why are you downcast, oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? I can remember when you showed your grace to me As a deer pants for water, so my soul thirsts for you And when I survey your splendor, you so faithfully renew Like a bed of rest for my fainting flesh I am satisfied in you Let my sighs give way to songs That sing about your faithfulness Let my pain reveal your glory As my only real rest Let my loss assure And your waves crash down on me I'll recall your safety scheme You're the one who made the waves And your son went out to suffer in my place And to tell me that I'm safe So why am I down? Why so disturbed? I am satisfied in you I am satisfied in you I am satisfied